I haven't shared many personal stories from my childhood that relate to my heart condition, so I thought this would be the perfect video to do so, considering I'm doing nothing heart-related in the video footage. <laughs> so while I'm getting ready for the winter holidays, I'm going to share my earliest memories of living with CHD and some of the struggles I had to overcome. The majority of people don't have memories of their life before the age of three, or sometimes even before the age of seven. Many people also fabricate memories so as to have a complete narrative of their life. I'm no exception, so some of the memories I'll be sharing are ones my parents have told me. The earliest memory I personally have is playing at a summer daycare program before I entered preschool. I was friends with this girl named Molly, I think that was her name, and there was a wooden structure outside where we'd play house. For some reason I had her picture and kept it in a black and white heart-shaped locket with some family photos. After this memory comes a smattering of quick images and places I recall. My mom's office at the local college, piles of stuffed animals on the green couch in my room, and a stack of trading cards from the PBS show Arthur. <laughs> Time seems to jump here, and what I recall next are memories centered around recovering from my third heart surgery. Not physically recovering, but mentally recovering. I don't recall physically recovering in the hospital, or for that matter anything to do with the hospital. I'm of the opinion that I blocked these memories out, but there is no way that I can forget that I did really love Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs when I was younger. Ah, my man turned into a tree! Where'd you go? Oh, wait, 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 how did trees laugh? <laughs> <laughs> That's how trees laugh. <laughs> I also can't ignore the story that my grandmother shares about the time she thought I'd died. I was recovering from my first surgery, completed just a few days after I was born. My grandmother was in a chair next to me dozing slightly when she was startled by the change in the monitors. Some of them beeped, or maybe they just lit up in a different way that she wasn't used to seeing, but she jumped out of her chair and called a nurse in. The nurse was like, you okay? And my grandmother pointed at me, is she okay? The monitors just went crazy. The nurse checked and said, she just farted. <laughs> I'm assuming my grandmother is misremembering this memory because I'm not sure if monitors can identify when a patient farts, so maybe it's possible the nurse was in the room and heard me fart? Either way, I've always thought that story funny. The next is a story my parents have shared with me. A friend of theirs, who very much disliked hospitals, built up enough courage to visit me. He made it to my room, delivered a stuffed bear, and passed out cold. Nurses had to come and help him. I still have that stuffed bear. It's white, with a red, felt-covered heart sewn onto the outside of its chest. For many years, that bear was my go-to stuffed animal for bedtime. My mental recovery from the surgeries is actually not that unique. Many children who have gone through a medical trauma early in their life have similar manifestations. So if you notice similarities between my story and yours, or your child's, I hope this helps you feel less alone. Once I started school, my struggles became apparent. Getting ready in the morning was difficult. I'd wake up and forget what I should do first, brush my teeth or have breakfast. So my mother took pictures of me getting ready in the morning and glued them to some cardboard. So if I did get lost in my thoughts, I could refer to the poster and instantly know what to do. This probably was just a me thing and might not have been connected to having surgeries because I am an imaginative person who enjoys getting lost in a fantasy and living my days where the clock doesn't dictate what I should do next. So the transition to school was difficult. I attended a parochial school set on a windy hill in downtown Portland. Students had to wear uniforms. I bounced between hating them and being grateful for them. I was grateful because it meant my outfit was already chosen. My clothes didn't define me, and I never had to think about what was popular. Sometimes I hated them because girls had to wear jumpers. Dresses weren't my thing, or skirts. I'd take pants any day, and not just any pants. I wanted sweatpants and sweatshirts. That's what I wore on the weekend until I was nearly in sixth grade. Clothes outside of sweats and my school uniform were itchy. 
That's how I described everything. If my mom had me try on my sister's old clothes, usually jeans and cotton t-shirts, they were itchy. I'd even squirm around on the ground like a feral cat trying to get the clothes off. My mom assumed this reaction was not typical, so she set up an appointment with a child therapist. I don't recall how frequently I saw her or for how long. I just thought I got to hang out with a woman and play games, but now looking back I realize it's strange that she had a pad of paper nearby to write notes on. One of the games I enjoyed playing was pretending to be a baby. A lot of kids do this, but I'm thinking I did it because I knew I had missed out on several months of being a kid. The therapist had one of those tan rubber dolls that, when squeezed, the red eyes, nose, and mouth would pop out. I remember squeezing that a lot, liking the way it felt between my fingers. Although I don't recall this, my mom tells me the therapist had a toy medical kit that I only touched once. The next memory I have of the therapist is fuzzy. My mom shared the story with me when I was older. Apparently, in one of our sessions, I took the dolls, ones with bendable rope legs and wooden hands and feet, from the dollhouse and buried them in the sandbox. I looked at the therapist and said, They're dead. Within seconds of saying this, I got nervous and dug them back out, saying, They're alive. It's okay. They're alive. See? This is what I will always be processing. Death. <laughs> what a lighthearted topic to go with these holiday visuals, huh? Before the therapist, I was often afraid to fall asleep. Even if my parents were downstairs, I'd be curled up in my bed anxious about nothing in particular. When we had babysitters, forget it. I'd be awake for as long as possible, listening to every noise. I actually already know what this is, because Amazon does a really bad job of hiding. Even though, like, I think maybe they might have clicked gift wrap. It says right here, at the bottom, it says hat. <laughs> now it's just a question, is it gonna fit? I hope so. Fuzzy. Oh my goodness. It looks super nice. Okay. Where does the tag go? Did, it, did the tag go on the side? Oh! <laughs> I look... Oh, cool. <laughs> what do you think, Seth? I think it's a little tall, but I have a fix for that. Oh, what are you gonna do? I think it's a little tall too, but it's cute. Like if I... <laughs> no, don't do that. Ah. Here, here, I'll show you what to do. <laughs> <laughs> this is my dance routine, everybody. I wanted that hat. It's gonna keep my head so nice and toasty. That's always the thing okay. that like... Try this. Oh, what did you do? Where did we go? <laughs> <laughs> nice and snug. <laughs> he put a towel in my hat. He put... So there's a group of us on Instagram that get together um, and connect and share posts about our YouTube videos that are centered around congenital heart conditions. Everybody in the Instagram group has a connection with CHD in some way. So if you're interested in checking out some other videos of CHDers, go ahead and check out the links in the description of this video. Thank you so much to whoever gave me this hat. I actually don't know who it is because it's Secret Santa. Yeah, I still don't know who gave me this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Until I started high school, I left my door cracked open to let the light from the nightlight in the hallway shine into my room. I still can't put my finger on what frightens me or what makes me reluctant to fall asleep, but to this day, in order to fully relax before falling asleep, I need to know someone is nearby. College was great because I had roommates or someone was always out in the hallway. 
When I was younger, I do recall waking up several times trying to catch my breath from dreams with lingering sounds of metallic instruments hitting a tray or the beeping of monitors. Often, the only thing I could visually remember from these dreams were the fluorescent lights flashing by on the ceiling. Was it terrifying? For me, not really. I didn't enjoy them, but they weren't that scary because I could anticipate them. If I slept in a new place or I rearranged my room, I knew I'd have a medical dream. The dreams have lessened as I've gotten older, to the point where I have one of these dreams maybe once a year. Just a few months ago, I had a medical dream, brought on by the interviews I've done with members of the CHD community. Don't worry, none of my interviews are at fault here. I'm glad I've interviewed so many people, and I'll continue. P.S. If you haven't seen your interview pop up, don't worry. I'm posting them in 2021. Okay, back to the dream. This one is rather intense. I'll describe it. If you don't want to hear it, jump to the next timestamp. The dream. I was in surgery. Awake. My chest was open. My ribs spread wide. And I could just barely see the red glob of my heart beating ever so slightly below me. I was freezing. Doctors looked down at me, asking me questions while they went in with metal instruments. As the dream came to an end, it dawned on me that being awake during a surgery like this was probably not a good idea, and I was about to tell them that they should knock me out when feeling came back into my limbs. I felt everything they were doing. Then I woke up. I haven't had a horrific dream like that ever, so when I woke up, it took me several seconds to believe that if I moved, I would be okay, and once I did move, I looked down to make sure that my chest was not open. Obviously it wasn't, and I'm doing okay now. By having time with a the therapist to pretend I was younger, bury some dolls in the sand, and eventually playing with the medical kit, I was exploring topics I would otherwise not want to touch. Eventually, my annoyance with clothes, other than sweatpants and sweatshirts, lessened, and my nightmares melted into the background. If I could get away with it, I still wore sweats, but it wasn't until the fifth grade, <laughs> when I had a nun for a teacher, that I really snapped out of the sweatshirt and sweatpant phase. Yes. Maybe it had to do with the fact that this nun terrified everyone. I kept a list of how many times she made each student cry. She'd constantly chastise us by saying things like, I'm gonna hang you from the chandelier. She was so scary that we took her seriously despite the school not having any chandeliers. Or maybe we assumed someone had hung her from a chandelier at some point and that's why she was okay with doing it to others. This was also the year I learned about periods. How, you ask? This nun threw colorful brochures on our desks and said, You're gonna bleed soon. Any questions? We did have questions, but she was completely uncomfortable answering, so we either never got a straight answer, or somehow she navigated the conversation into strange memories about her youth, one of them involving her sledding and sliding underneath the iron gate of a cemetery. I'm pretty sure that had I not had her as my fifth grade teacher, I would have mentally matured much slower. She had a way of making me want to grow up and attempt to be mature, or at least show others that I was in control of my emotions. But let's face it, no adult is really in control of their emotions, but that year I learned a thing or two. Fifth grade was also the year I found a love of books. Once I entered middle school, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, I had a pretty good idea of who I was, and the struggles I faced when I was younger felt distant. Everyone copes with CHD differently. You or your child might take longer to come to terms with the diagnosis, or maybe it will be a shorter period of time. There is no right way to cope with anything. There will always be the media depicting the typical way people handle difficulties, but that's one perspective. No one should feel obligated to follow another's grieving or coping process. We are all unique. We are all unbeatable in our own way. 
A quick shout out to Team Heart on YouTube, which is actually an Instagram page, despite the name. <laughs> um, and it is a wonderful group of people who have CHD conditions, and we vlog about it and talk about it on YouTube. If you're not familiar with this group, go ahead and head on over to the Instagram page, which is in the description of this video, and you will be able to see other patients with CHD conditions share their stories on YouTube. Thank you to everybody who supports by watching these videos, liking, commenting, and subscribing. That always helps me uh, grow my channel and lets others see my channel because the algorithm in YouTube is crap at the moment. So if you would like to share this video with anyone, please do so. It would be greatly appreciated because I know that my story is unique, but it is also very helpful to those who have had anything to do with congenital heart conditions, just to hear someone else's perspective is so helpful and empowering and makes us all feel less alone. So happy holidays to everybody out there and thank you again for supporting my channel. Keep being your unbeatable self.